Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. First, uh, 8 o'clock, this is way past my bedtime, by the way. Uh, what a crowd. You make us feel like rock stars. It feels like a sporting event. I expect a lot of applause um, <laughs> for both of us, for the points you like, for the points you dislike. You can hiss. It's up to you. But thank you. Thank you for coming out. This is a tremendous... I had no clue that um, half of MSU would come out and, and see this, but it looks like it is. So thank you, and welcome Dr. Lennox to Bozeman and Montana State University. A well, well, well welcome to you. We are privileged to host uh, such an esteemed scholar and speaker, and um, I welcome all the MSU students, faculty, and Bozeman residents. And we look forward to your questions uh, very much. My opinions here tonight, my views, are not the opinions of the Montana State Honors College, Department of History and Philosophy, the MSU Track and Field Program, <laughs> or any other human, human being as far as I know. I take full and sole responsibility for whatever I say tonight. Uh, and let me note, uh, Dr. Lennox, Lennox, I've enjoyed viewing some of your, the U YouTube coverage of your previous Veritas forums. Um, I've not read your books, but then you have not read mine either, <laughs> since I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, I want to thank the good folk behind Veritas for creating a marvelous opportunity for exchanging ideas about this most important issue, and thank you, uh, Greg, for volunteering to moderate. I have many questions, some opinions, and no answers. Raised by a scientist father and Episcopalian mother, I grew up without any indoctrination toward either theism or atheism not even Greek Orthodox. It's worth considering that had I been raised in New Delhi, I probably would have been Hindu. Raised in Pakistan, Muslim. Raised in fifth century BCE in Athens, a polytheist trying to please Zeus and Poseidon. Raised in Bozeman, a hedonist. <laughs> if, our, if our worldview is so contingent on when, where, and by whom we were raised, then how can we say that one is more correct than the other? All my life I've approached monotheistic religion as an outsider looking in. I'm not a scientist either. Tonight I'll ask a few questions that have always puzzled me as the outsider, admittedly Socratic gadfly type questions. Some of the time I'm agnostic about God's existence for the reasons stated by Dostoevsky's character, Ivan, in his novel, The Brothers Karamazov. To quote, just as my puny Euclidean mind cannot understand how two parallel lines may meet somewhere in infinity, so I can't expect to understand about God. How could I solve problems not of this world? If physics literally determines my brain's limits, then whatever exists metaphysically necessarily exists outside of these limits. Like Ivan, I'd be intellectually dishonest if I did not acknowledge that it's possible, but humanly inconceivable, that God exists. For those, of you know, for those of you who know Kant, this is like Kant's noumena. But suppose I'm an atheist. In the metaphysical scenario where God does exist, since this God created my limited Euclidean brain, I would expect that he would expect that I would use it. Since grasping God's existence is beyond the capacity of my brain, he should not expect me to grasp his existence. Which leads to a question. Why would an all-perfect, perfectly secure God need or even desire that I believe that he exists? This makes sense for an insecure human parent, but not a three-year God. Moreover, if God loves me unconditionally with no strings and has created me with a Euclidean mind, how could his love for me hinge on whether I believe that he exists or on whether I love him or not? And this puzzles me. 
how does Christianity accommodate the truths of astronomy and geology? When humans first imagined the metaphysics of monotheism, only a few thousand years ago, the universe appeared rather small. It would not have seemed preposterous that God, had heaven, God and heaven were above and hell below. Nor would it have been a stretch to feel that humans were at the center of things. Additionally, as far as anyone knew scientifically, humans and the earth had been around for about the same amount of time. Now science tells a different story. Spatially and numerically, we are incomprehensibly tiny. Our solar system is only one among billions. It has been estimated that there are as many stars in the universe as there are grains of sand on Earth. It's a staggering number. The odds of there being other solar systems with planets capable of sustaining organic life are extraordinarily good. We are not alone. How does the Christian faith accommodate these facts? Did Jesus die and resurrect only on this planet? Or did the same happen on other planets? Geological science now tells us that in the history of our Earth, humans, humans came on the scene remarkably late. Imagine condensing a play about the entire history of the planet, 4.6 billion years, into a 30-day, 24-hour nonstop show. Condensing the Earth's history into 30 days would make each second represent 1,775 years. The agricultural revolution happens as the curtain is coming down with only six seconds left. Jesus is born a little before the last second of the entire play. Why did God wait so long to send his only son to earth to save humanity? I do lean very strongly toward atheism some of the time. A non-denominational atheism. Not the militant denomination I've heard John talk about. I'm the type of atheist who carries around the portable atheist. It's a book. Maybe that's my denomination. Why is this, though? One reason is that I find the universe and human life itself far more magical, special, and tantalizingly incomprehensible without divine purpose than with divine purpose. On the atheistic premise, conscious beings like ourselves got extraordinarily lucky, winning the cosmic lottery for existence. And according to evolutionary biology, we are very fortunate that events conspired to make it possible that humans were selected for over many thousands of years of the struggle for existence. On the theistic premise, the lottery was rigged, rigged for you and me to win. I'd rather live in a universe where I won fair and square. I'm a part-time atheist for other reasons as well. As it appears to my puny Euclidean mind, the problem of evil is intractable, I agree with Dawkins and others that natural selection is the best explanation for why we're here, and that, and that divine intelligence not only is superfluous, but redoubles the explanatory problem. The first cause argument in cosmology doesn't work for me, because I don't see the necessity of a first cause in the first place. And I haven't yet experienced revelation, but I'm waiting. Can a human being have purpose in a godless universe? Yes. After this forum tonight, my purpose will, go, will be to go home and get a good night's sleep in order to be there for my wife and daughter in the morning. This is purpose enough without divine metaphysical backing. Leo Tolstoy created his own orthodox version of Christianity because he felt that a finite life without divine purpose is meaningless. Is it? Can't I forge meaning from the small things, such as the pleasures of collegiality, canine companionship, good food, running on Montana mountain trails, Beethoven's last piano sonatas, and family love? I think so. Thank you.
Well said. John, perhaps you could tell us about your worldview. And, and since Don brought a number of questions up, and this con uh, this talk is about, I am. <laughs> what, what, what more do you want? Um, <clears throat> Maybe you could frame your presentation in terms of you being a Christian and a scientist. I think a lot of people in this room would see someone as a Christian scientist kind of on par with like square circles or merry bachelors, right? Or, you know, or like good country music, right? I mean, it's a contradiction in, <laughs> contradiction in terms. So how do like, you know, how, how, does, this, how does this work? Could you maybe explain how your, how your Christian faith informs your science and vice versa? Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me here to dialogue with two such distinguished people. And um, my uh, colleague, Professor Dimitriadis, has the supreme advantage of being a Greek. Because, you see, I have such respect for the pre-Socratic Greeks and my hero is Socrates. So he's got a real head start this evening. Now, I've been here before in Yellowstone Park uh, twice, and we looked for bobcats, and we didn't find any, but now I realize they're all here. <laughs> it's wonderful to have an opportunity to engage in friendly discussion. I agree with my colleague. This isn't a debate. So let me address the question head on. I do believe that science and faith in God, and in my case, and Christianity, are completely compatible. There's a widespread impression that they're not. But uh, that widespread impression has got to be false, because if you take the Nobel Prize for Physics, last year it was won by a Scotsman, Peter Higgs, who's an atheist. A few years back it was won the same prize by an American physicist, Bill Phillips. He's a Christian. So clearly what divides them is not their science. What divides them is their worldview. One's an atheist, the other's a theist. So you'll find brilliant atheists doing science and brilliant Christians doing science. And what I want to suggest to you tonight is that the real tension exists between the two worldviews and there are scientists on both sides. Now, I then ask the next question, which way do I think science points? Is it neutral? Does it point towards theism? Or does it point towards atheism? Well, historically, one of the very interesting things that's always fascinated me is that modern science arose in the 16th and 17th centuries in Western Europe. And the general consensus of opinion is called Merton's thesis or North Whitehead's thesis. And expressed by C.S. Lewis, it goes like this. Men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. So my first point is I'm not remotely embarrassed at claiming to be both a scientist and a Christian because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. Now, it's interesting to just focus on why the change between, say, Newton and Hawking. Isaac Newton discovered the law of gravity. And when he discovered it, he wrote the Principia Mathematica, expressing the hope that it would lead a thinking person to believe in a deity. Stephen Hawking uses the law of gravity to argue that there's no God. So there's the very same law of gravity used in two different directions. How has that happened? Well, a very brief look at it shows you that it results from certain confusions. The first confusion is, oddly enough, about the nature of God. Many people, when they hear me talk about God, they, well, they think about the tooth fairy. By the way, we ought to deal with that quickly. Have you ever met an adult that came to believe in the tooth fairy? No? I've met thousands who've come to believe in Jesus Christ. So let's not compare those two. We can dismiss that immediately. That's trivial Freudianism. So let me get back to the main point, which is Isaac Newton did not believe in a God of the gaps. A God of the gaps is the idea, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. And as science advances, the God disappears. And of course, that's what many people think I believe. I don't believe in a God of the gaps at all. I believe 
in a God of the whole show. He created the bits I do understand, and he created the bits I don't. And that accords with our own experience. The more you understand about engineering, the more you can admire Rolls-Royce, not the less. And so when Newton, the more he discovered about the way the universe worked, the more he admired the genius of the God that had did it, done it that way. So it's not a God of the gaps. But, and I want you to try and follow the logic of this because it's very important. Because many people, including Richard Dawkins, Stephen Hawking, and so on, think that believers in God are all in the same class, they believe in a God of the gaps. Now, if you define God to be that which science has not yet explained, of course you will say that science and God are opposed because that's the way you define God. You've defined the contradiction, but once you begin to see that God is the God of the whole show, that simply disappears. So that the more science advances, the more you admire the God that did it that way. And that brings me to the next point, which is that God is not the same kind of explanation as science. Newton realized that. So let me illustrate that simply. Why is the water boiling? Well, it's boiling because there's energy going through from the gas into the kettle, and the molecules are getting agitated and so on. That's why it's boiling. Nonsense. It's boiling because I want a cup of tea. Well, you're laughing, and it's good because you see the difference between two kinds of explanation. It's not nonsense. Both of those explanations are perfectly valid. The one's a scientific one. The other is an agent one. You do notice, by the way, that those explanations don't conflict. They're complementing each other. And what I want to say is this. God no more competes with science as an explanation of the universe then Henry Ford competes with the law of internal combustion as an explanation for the automobile. And the problem is people don't realize that explanation comes at different levels. And so they see a competition where there is no necessary competition at all. And that's one of the reasons I'm so happy to do science. Indeed, the mandate for doing science is found in the first couple of pages of the Bible. I wonder if you knew that. The basic scientific discipline in all fields is taxonomy, giving names to things. And it was God told um, human beings to do it according to the account in Genesis. You go and do it. I'm not going to do it for you. So the mandate for doing science came from God himself. He's not anti-science. He's not anti-intellectual. He's pro-science. And I was brought up in a home, I might as well tell you my background briefly, where my parents were Christian, but they were very unusual for Northern Irish Christians. They weren't sectarian, and secondly, they allowed me to think. And my first experience of Christianity was intellectually open, it was expansive, and so on and so forth. It never occurred to me for quite a long time that Christians could be narrow-minded. Uh, unfortunately, I discovered that was the case. Um, a little bit later. So, confusion number one is not understanding the nature of God. We're talking about the Creator, not a Greek God of the gaps. Secondly, there's a confusion about the nature of explanation. There's agent explanation and there's scientific explanation, and they work together. Thirdly, there is massive confusion about the nature of God. That was one of the words in our title. Richard Dawkins has put about the idea, the God delusion, that faith is believing where there's no evidence. That is false to its etymology. That's blind faith, and it's very dangerous. Faith comes from the Latin fides. It means trust, belief. And of any belief, if you, win the, if you believe the bobcats are going to win next season, I'm going to ask you, what's your evidence? And I hope you've got lots of it. Um, so, of any belief statement, faith statement, we always ask, what's the evidence? And one of the problems is that often people don't realize that science involves faith just as much as Christianity. Now, let me illustrate that. Um, I, and it will reference one point that Don made, I had a debate with Peter Singer in Australia, the famous professor from Princeton. 
And I told the audience, as I've told you, that my parents were Christian and so were my grandparents and, and so were their parents. So it's obviously Irish genetics produces Christianity. <laughs> and Peter Singer got up and he said, there you are, you see, you were born in Ireland, you're a Christian. If you'd been born in India, you would have been a Hindu and so on and so forth, you see. So I said to Peter when I got the chance, I said, Peter, you haven't told us about your parents. Were they atheists? Yes, he said, they were. Oh, I said, you remained in the faith in which you've been brought up. Oh, but he said, it isn't a faith. Oh, I said, sorry, Peter, I thought you believed it. <laughs> and cyberspace went viral at that point. Here was one of the world's leading philosophers that didn't realize his atheism, his naturalism is a belief system. He believes it. Now, we need to get this straight because often people meet me and they say, oh, Lennox, he's a man of faith, which is the greatest insult that you can get these days because it means he believes where there's no evidence. And let me lay it down very clearly. I believe that the Christian faith, other faiths must speak for themselves, is evidence-based. For example, in the fourth gospel, John, uh, John says, uh, Jesus did many other signs which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. In other words, here's the evidence. I wouldn't sit here for a millisecond if I didn't believe my faith was evidence-based. But now let me switch it into science. I have lots of fun in Oxford when the conversation gets boring. So I say to some of my colleagues, what do you do science with? Oh, they say I've had a billion dollar grant. Well, we don't get billion dollar grants, but we've had a big grant and we've got this marvelous machine. Oh, I said, I don't mean that. I mean this. Oh, you mean my, and they nearly say mind, and they remember there's no such thing as mind. So they say brain. I do believe there's such a thing as mind. So you do science with your brain, yes? Tell me about your brain. Give me the short account of the brain. Well, they say the brain is the product of a mindless, unguided process. And I look at them and I smile and they say, and you trust it? <laughs> you might be interested, ladies and gentlemen, to know that it was Darwin first thought of that difficulty. I doubt, he said, the horrible doubt creeps into my mind. How can the human mind be reliable if it has, as I believe, descended simply by natural processes from lower minds? You see, ladies and gentlemen, one of my main reasons for not being an atheist is that following atheism to its logical conclusion removes all meaning from my science because it destroys rationality. It reduces it to the meaningless chatter of firing synapses in the human brain. And what interests me greatly is that one of the world's leading atheist philosophers has grasped that, Thomas Nagel in a book with the most explosive subtitle you'll ever see anywhere. Mind and Cosmos, why the neo-Darwinian view of the world is almost certainly false. And he points out that if the mental is reducible to the physical, that dissolves meaning. Lewis saw it a long time ago. And the leading American philosopher, Alvin Plantinga, has written a great deal about it. So let me explain that. It's very important to me that following the atheist path removes any basis for trusting rationality. So that, I say to some of my colleagues, doesn't that mean that your faith in the, your rationality is completely blind? The odd thing is, it seems to me the shoe's on the other foot. My Christian faith in God is not blind. It's based on evidence from science and elsewhere, which we can discuss later. So that, that's just a very short and simple introduction to why I think that science actually itself points not towards atheism, but towards theism. Thank you very much. Check. Thank you, John. Well, thank you, too. Um, I, 
don't know if you, those of you who fly airplanes ever think about this. John, you fly quite a lot. So let's see if you think about this. You get, before you get on the plane, you think, you know, the laws of aerodynamics work again. And we don't even think about it. We get on the plane and we think the laws of aerodynamics um, are going to work. They worked last time. Damn it, they better work again. But we, we trust the laws of aerodynamics. When we get on the plane, I trust it with my life. I don't want them to fail when I'm up 20,000 feet, whatever it is. I have, yes, I have faith. Good man. <laughs> in Boeing airplanes, because I have faith that, yes, I do trust that the laws of aerodynamics will work this time. But why do I trust those laws? Do I trust them because an all-powerful divine agent made them reliable? I trust them because they worked so many times before. It's called inductive reasoning. To build that trust in the laws of aerodynamics, I don't need, it's superfluous, to posit a creator, a divine, an agent who made those laws. Rather, I can just use inductive evidence. And that, for me, builds trust that when I get on the plane, it's not going to fall down immediately from the sky. I think that this type of faith here perhaps contrary to what John's been saying, is, is, is not, we don't, I don't need for it to exist, um, either the belief in or the reality of a divine agent who authored that law. And that, that, of course, goes for the law of gravity as well. We trust natural law, physical law, daily, and we have faith in it. But that faith, I think, is very, very different from faith in a divine agent. That's my first comment. Do you want me to come back on that, or can do you I want to make to a few one, more? Can I go one more? Oh, as many as you like. Okay. Um, <laughs> evidence and faith. Uh, if, I don't know if you're familiar with William Paley's famous argument uh, from design for God's existence, um, and it's been reworked many, many times since Paley in the 1600s. Argument goes in a nutshell. Um, we come across a watch. For Paley, it was a pocket watch, but for me, it's a wristwatch. We come across the watch and we look at it and we go, My goodness, my Buddha. Um, that must have been created by, that, that, that watch exhibits design. It exhibits design. Look at it. Look how complicated it is. And all the, war, wa the parts work together for a certain function. It must exhibit design. And, and we might say that without flinching, uh, without thinking twice about it. Um, then uh, we look at the human eye, for example, or any human, complicated human organ like the brain. And we say, oh yes, in that case, uh, the, the human brain also exhibits design. It's a very complicated mechanism that where the parts work together for, for a purpose, for a function. Next premise, we say, well, the, the watch must have been made by an intelligent designer. And it was made by a human engineer. Um, it was engineered. Therefore, the human brain, the human eye, any complicated um, biological organism itself must also have been made, manufactured, by uh, an intelligent designer. Therefore, God exists, and God is the author of uh, human and biological complex systems. Now. The evidence here in this argument, I think, is that the human brain exhibits design. Because the argument runs on the basis of it exhibiting the same kind of design as the watch. Otherwise, the inference doesn't hold up. And we, we might say in this case that the ev there's evidence here of divine creation because the evidence is the existence of design in natural uh, complex organisms. But I would suggest that what we're doing there is we're projecting um, the attribute, the design, onto the complex or, uh, organic organism in order to get our conclusion. Is the piece of evidence really that it exhibits design? Or is the piece of evidence that it's a brain working uh, in harmony with its parts to create thoughts and consciousness? 
Um, but it doesn't exhibit the same type of design that the watch does. So we can try to criticize Paley's argument, and the evidence here, the question is, what is the evidence? If the evidence is, is uncontroversially designed in, 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 in complex biological organisms, then maybe the inference works. But I would suggest that that claim is not a piece of evidence, but a piece of faith. Do you want me to respond to that? If you want to. Well, I'd like to say one or two things about what you said at the beginning. Um, that just picking out one or two that particularly uh, struck me. First of all, the idea that the universe was thought to be very small, and now we realize it's very large, and how could you possibly believe in God? Well, what science has shown us is that you need a very large and ancient universe in order to have human life. I think the argument goes precisely the other way around. And actually, size, I was very interested in your numerical arguments about size, because you're thinking linearly, of course, but if you think logarithmically, think of the average human being at just under six feet tall. Well, at a logarithmic scale, they're almost exactly uh, midway between the size of an elementary particle and the size of the observable universe. So if you think logarithmically, we're pretty big. So I don't think that kind of argument has got a great deal of mileage uh, in it. But to come to what you've just said, uh, there are two things, induction, and, and so on. And you say you don't need God. Well, now, half a moment. Your faith in uh, the laws of thermodynamics, or the, sorry, the laws of uh, aerodynamics, uh, and I hope it's balanced by your faith in Boeing engineers as well, um, uh, depends entirely on your rationality being reliable. And the point I'm making is much deeper than that. It's that if this rationality we are using to make these inductive results, of course you don't see God in there. He has, uh, uh, you can investigate a Ford motor car for 100 years, you'll never find Henry Ford. And yet there's evidence of his input. Oh, uh, you know that, don't you? Um, <laughs> there's evidence of his activity in the whole thing. You're asking the wrong kind of question there. So I would simply want to say, I step in a plane this morning, and I trust it. I have grounds for trusting it. But they occur at many different levels. And the God question doesn't come up until you're right down to the level of, well, why would you trust the rationality to discover those laws of aerodynamics and so on in the first place? Why would you trust your experience uh, of it happening so many times in the past and so on? And that is where I think that God is not only relevant, but necessary. And then you come to the design argument. Now, this interests me greatly. And it's really the topic of a huge discussion. Uh, I wonder what Paley would have said when they discovered the first biological clock. Because the interesting thing is that within our human biological systems, there are clocks that are infinitely more sophisticated than the clocks we are, uh, watches we instantly recognize as products of design. Now, it's interesting that everybody agrees with Don in saying the universe and biology is apparently designed. It could just still be that the reason for that is that it's actually designed. And the point I would want to make is this. I take Hume's point, but I, I think it's slightly beside the point in the sense that when you attribute something to design, you're making an inference, not inductive now, but abductive, to the best explanation of what you find. And what interests me, because there's a lot of argument about is this particular bacterial flagellum intelligently designed or not, could there be a possible evolutionary pathway, and so on and so forth. As a mathematician, I'm much more interested in the next level down. And that is the fact that we have lived to discover that the genetic base of life, so far as we understand it, is digital and it's linguistic. Now, we are used in science to accepting a fair measure of reductionism. That is, you explain the complex in terms of the simple. And that's marvelous when you can do it. The problem is we've been, I, from my perspective, brainwashed into thinking 
that everything in the universe can be explained bottom up as a reductionalistically. I don't believe that's true. I believe there's one startling and obvious exception, and that is anything that involves semiotics, meaning language. The moment you see, you look up there and you see Bobcat. Now, there may have been many automatic processes involved in producing that poster up there, but the instant you see those six letters, you infer that somewhere in that process there has been a mind involved. Why? Because it's linguistic. You know of no exception to that in human languages, in computer languages, and so on. Now, I sometimes have a little bit of fun with people that insist on reductionism. And uh, if I'm sitting at table, they say, everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. So I say, try this menu, roast chicken. You explain to me the semiotics of the letters R-O-A-S-T in terms of the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. And I'll never forget one of the world's leading biochemists who paused and he said, I've for 40 years gone into my laboratory thinking that could be done. And then he said, it obviously can't. And I was so stunned. I said to him, but physics and chemistry have only been going for five or 600 years. He said, it doesn't matter. You've got to have a mind because there are semiotics there. But then I asked this. I said, you've looked at a five-letter word. You studied DNA in the laboratory. That's got 3.5 billion letters in exactly the right order. What about the origin of that? Whatever natural processes are involved. He said, chance and the laws of nature. I said, what? The thing that screams at us from every one of the 10 trillion cells in our body is that whatever the past etiology in terms of natural processes, there must be mind behind it because it's a word. And that is why the Christian explanation of the universe resonates so powerfully with me. It's not in the beginning were the particles and mind is derivative, it's the exact opposite. In the beginning was the word and all things came to be through him. So that's how I would begin to respond to that. Do you want to continue along this line of design? Sure, what I was thinking of, you both have touched on this, and you mentioned it in your opening presentation about this move from design, uh, explaining design by way of mind. And you suggested a, a long, say, someone like Richard Dawkins or someone like that, that that actually uh, begs the question, right? Check. Um, I, think, I think John wants to go this route, that my consciousness couldn't exist unless there was a more complicated higher consciousness that is the logos that created it. Absolutely okay. right. Thank you so for I, saying that. I it captured it. OK. <laughs> um, the other view is that the so-called bubble-up theory of consciousness, or bottom-up theory, um, that natural processes over a long, long period of natural selection got very, very complicated. And out of that emerged, as an emergent property, consciousness, thoughts, feelings, emotions, love poetry. Which theory do I think works best? I think that the top-down theory introduces an element that complicates and redoubles the explanatory problem. You're trying to explain consciousness itself, re remarkably complex and mysterious, by a much, much, much larger, perhaps infinite, complex, mysterious thing. You have redoubled the explanatory problem. The other way, bottom up, consciousness emerges at some point during the process of natural selection. We don't know exactly when, and Darwin sort of anticipated this. We don't know exactly when, but sometime, human beings suddenly had interiority, had a first person perspective on the world. Yes, indeed, it seems magical, and it is ma I think it is magical, consciousness. But for me, what's more magical is that, and, 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 more, and more special, is that it emerged from simpler processes. It's a very complex phenomenon known as consciousness, which all of us now share in this room, emerged from simpler building blocks. And to me, that is a simpler, more 
elegant explanation. I'm interested you describe it as magical. I don't believe in magic. But let me come to discuss what you've just said. There are a couple of things there that are extremely uh, interesting. Firstly, the power of natural selection. Now, the power of ma natural selection has been massively overrated as some of the world's leading biologists have come to see. For many years, the standard work on the subject was the blind watchmaker, in which Richard Dawkins made the famous statement that natural selection, the blind unconscious automatic process that Darwin discovered is the explanation for the existence and variety of all life, I quote. He has since retracted half of that statement because he must have known for a very long time that natural selection, the one thing it cannot explain is life itself for the very simple reason that you cannot have natural selection unless you've got life there in the first place. So we need to separate things that differ, ladies and gentlemen. Natural selection can only select things that already exist, that are produced by another process. Now, I don't intend to divert this too far because this is a huge and fascinating topic. I simply want to make the point that the idea of emergence is a multi uh, covers a multitude, I nearly said, of sins, but uh, uh, what I will say is emerges how? Emerges automatically, emerges with energy, emerges with heat, emerges with the catalyst, or emerges with input of information. All of those things are emergent. Saying a thing is an emergent property is saying absolutely nothing until you have defined a mechanism that actually produces it. But I think the most important argument that, that Don has raised there and it's the heart of Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. It's this, and I take the point straight away, that you need to be very careful if you're not complexifying a thing unnecessarily. And I think if I understand you right, Don, what you're saying is that, you know, if you postulate a complex explanation that's more complicated than the thing you're explaining, then it's not an explanation. That, that's the way Dawkins puts it. Okay. Well, I don't accept that in certain obvious areas. Let me test it on Richard Dawkins himself, as I did in public with him. I, I, I found a big thick book of 400 pages or so, and it calls itself The God Delusion. It's quite complex. So I asked myself what its origin is. And I discovered that the postulated origin by many people is that it originated in the infinitely more complex mind of Richard Dawkins. So I reject that, of course because the explanation is far more complex than the thing you're explaining. Well, that's sheer nonsense. In many areas of life, now notice again my example, language is involved, ladies and gentlemen. Another simple illustration, my menu, or Bobcat, six letters. To explain that at any level, you've got to introduce the bewildering complexity of a human mind. But that's quite simple, isn't it? A couple of scratches in a cave in China might be the symbol for a human being, and you've got to postulate a human being as an explanation. So we mustn't go around with the idea that an explanation cannot be, in some sense, very much more complicated than the thing you're explaining, and it's not a science stopper either. Think of archaeology. You see a script, and you say, well, that's language, so it must have been produced by human beings. That doesn't stop science. You then sort, what sort of beings produced that? What was their intelligence? What had they discovered? And so on and so forth. So I simply reject that idea, but I'm cautious. We don't, Einstein once said, let an explanation be simple, but no more simple than necessary. And I would submit to you that there are certain areas of life where the explanation is bound to be at one level more complex than the thing that you are explaining. Yeah, let's, uh, I think we should shift gears here and talk about something that, uh, I mean, so far we've been talking in a level, some level of abstraction here. <clears throat> but let's talk about something that is uh, pretty much familiar to all of us as human beings and and counts in many ways, I think, against the existence of a mind, God, right? The problem of evil. 
it, we could go on. I could s spend 15 minutes describing the suffering and the atrocities that go on in this world. And for many people, it's that reality, John, that uh, makes it impossible for them to believe in the existence of an omnibenevolent, a loving God. I think it was Hans Kung, the Catholic theologian, who said that uh, evil is the rock, suffering is the rock of atheism. So before you address that, you know, for Christianity, I mean, this seems to be one of the major objections. But on the other hand, Don, I don't, from my perspective, no matter what worldview you have, no matter what worldview you have, you have to deal with suffering. Whether you're a Christian, you're a Buddhist, you're a Hindu, part-time atheist, whatever you might be, right, you have to deal with this reality, this overwhelming reality of suffering. So I think uh, we need to spend some time in dealing with this question. Um, you know. Thanks, Greg. You, you uh, phrased it well. Um, we were the other day in the office, Greg and I, we share an office at MSU, and uh, um, he uh, complained that he forgot his reading glasses. In fact, he just started to re wear reading glasses. Thanks for making that public. Sure, uh, sure. sure. <laughs> now he's suffering. <laughs> At, at many levels. <laughs> and and it, it, it's the case that for some, well, not many of you out there, you, you can't see up, clo up close anymore. I certainly can't either. That's why I have to, have to um, uh, carry these around. And, and I thought to myself, you know, why would an all-loving, perfect designer create the human eye that inevitably at 50 or so years of age, deteriorate so that you can't see up close. If I were designing humanity, I would not have included that feature. So this is not leukemia, this is not death by tornadoes, this is not a, a tsunami, this is an everyday nuisance experienced by elder human beings. And I don't understand, for the life of me, why it was included in intelligent design. This is the problem of evil. This is a, a rather mundane instance of the problem of evil, but I think it raises the problem um, as acutely as uh, cancer, etc. An all-powerful, all-loving God has the power to prevent suffering. An all-loving God should want people not to suffer his creations, yet suffering exists. This is called the problem of evil. Um, a tornado uh, in Kansas uh, is, is, is um, steering its way toward a small trailer park. God, um, being omniscient, can see the tornado going toward the trailer park. God, being omnipotent, can steer the tornado away from the trailer park. God, being omnibenevolent, should not want those people to die in the trailer park, but tornado hits the trailer park. This is a, a, a puzzle, a, a apparent inconsistency here. So from bad eyes to tornadoes, my worry is that, my feeling is that the existence of this type of gratuitous suffering is, is strong evidence that if a God does exist, a God could not be both all-powerful and all-loving at the same time. And this, for me, uh, is difficult to overcome. Um, and I'd be interested to hear the Christian response. This is the hardest problem I face. And I've been in Auschwitz many times. I've wept every time. And in a room like this, there are people who are hurting and suffering and asking big questions. So I'm very sensitive to the fact that it's got two perspectives. Cancer looks very different to an oncologist as it does to a young woman who's just been told she's three months to live. And I want to go about responding to this very sensitively because I have deep sympathy with many of my friends, and I mean friends, not acquaintances, friends, who've given up on God because of this problem for reasons that Don has mentioned. I've got a very deep sympathy. I reacted to it in two ways. One, 
I suppose intellectually and secondly pastorally. The intellectual reaction must be very brief, although it's, it's quite complex if you detail it. Is atheism a solution to the problem of pain and evil? Well, in one sense it's just saying that's how the universe is. There's no God, that's how it is. Richard Dawkins, as usual, goes further than most people. And he says, well, the universe is just what we'd expect to find if at bottom there is no good, no evil, and no justice. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. I've faced him with that a couple of times, and he's never retracted it. But listen to what he's saying. There's no good and no evil, so why does he rail against God and say, talk about a problem of evil if he can't formulate it? If his atheism destroys the category of good and evil. And I think Dostoevsky, and I'm glad we share a love for Russian novelists, I think Dostoevsky was right when he said, if God does not exist, then everything is permissible. He didn't mean that atheists couldn't behave morally. Of course they can. From where I sit, everybody, whether they believe in God or not, is a moral being. So my atheist friends can put me to shame morally. What Dostoevsky meant is that there's no rational justification for calling something good and evil if there's no God. It's exactly parallel to the point I made earlier about rationality. But as I say, having said that, my atheist friends still talk about evil. And the reason from my perspective is they discover, like we all discover, that we're all moral beings. So we have to face it. So how do I face it? And we've all had the argument, the Hume argument, the Epicurean argument, if there's a good God, he should, would, could, and so on. I've never found a satisfactory solution to that, have you, even though I've sat up half the night discussing it when I was a student. So there's a problem here. If you go down the atheist route, you can remove the categories of good and evil that you're doing to make the criticism. And if that brings you back to God, you're faced with the question, how can a good God do it? So let me just very briefly, now this is, this is uh, uh, I apologize for this, yes? Yeah, very briefly. Okay, well there we are, you see. The, um, could God have made a world in which these things don't happen? Of course he could but none of us would have been in it. You can make a robotic world where there's no morality. I wouldn't like a robotic wife myself. If you're going to have a world in which there is love, the possibility of hate must be there. And I, I do think the free will defense, which I'm quoting, is extremely important. So that, to keep it brutally brief, my question is this. I'm faced with a mixed picture in the world. I see Yellowstone, it's beautiful. I see ISIS and people being beheaded. And the world is full of a mixed picture, beauty and barbed wire, beauty and bombs. And how do you face it? The Christian faces it this way. It's not an answer in the sense that you might like it, but it's a way in. At the heart of Christianity, there's a cross. The central claim of Christianity is that Jesus was God incarnate. So what's God doing on a cross? And the answer is that this must mean at least that God has become part of human suffering and not remain distant from it. Now the question is, granted that it's a mixed picture, is there any evidence in the universe that there's a God you could trust with it? And I think there is. One, because of the cross, but finally, because death is not the end. Jesus rose from the dead. And the early Christians preached. <laughs> the early Christians preached the resurrection as evidence of a final judgment. And that's a magnificent thing. Richard Dawkins says there's no justice. If life ends at death, ladies and gentlemen, the multi millions of people who've ever lived, the vast majority, will never see justice. They'll never get it in this life and there's no other life to get it in. So my position is, it takes a lot of evidence to believe what I'm about to say. My position is that one day, God, through Christ, will judge these situations so that in the end, no terrorist will ever get away with it. There will be perfect assessment and perfect judgment. That is, for, to my mind, the only way to begin to get into this question. Before 
we have questions from the audience, but before we get to that, I want to take uh, my privilege as a moderator and uh, push you both on this question for two reasons. One is uh, the question is uh, immensely important, and I think both of you realize that. <clears throat> but the second is, to be honest, I don't find either of your explanations very satisfying. Um, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Maybe if you buy me a beer afterwards, I'll feel a lot better. But we'll see. Okay. Uh, but two things, and I want to pose it to John first, and then and then to Don. Yeah, you mentioned briefly, and I understand your you know your your comments were truncated here. The free will defense, massively truncated. Yeah. Yes. So so let me push you on it, and then you can use this as a possibility to develop it a little bit more. The notion that we should be able to have the ability to choose to love or to not love someone, that free will, the, that option, right, is the only way that makes auth love authentic and real, seems to me to run into a, a, a couple problems from within the Christian worldview. Because there seems to me the instances where there is love without that free will, without that choice, and it is still authentic love. I, I find that very difficult to understand. Well, I'm about to I'm explain. afraid I don't find that explanation remotely satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> because, hold on, because... Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I haven't explained anything yet. Uh, uh, I'm the moderator. Oh, and, I see. Right, yes, yes, yes. I have explained nothing yet. So let me give you two examples, and then you can find if they're satisfactory or not. Think about, right, you are a Christian, so you believe not just in monotheism, but you believe in a Trinitarian God. I do, who, yes. On, who exists <laughs> in an eternal loving relationship mm -hmm. that could not exist otherwise. Yes. And that is yet authentic love. Mm -hmm. You believe at the end of history, or however you want to put it, that there will be a new heavens and new earth, where there will be no more pain, suffering, death, sin, right? That kind of thing. And in that realm, or in that reality, people will not be able to choose not to love. Mm -hmm. Yet, that, you would say, is still authentic love. So it seems to me, <laughs> you got a problem on your hands. Before you get to that, before you answer my question, let me go to Don here. Yeah. Don, you didn't even answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, how does your <laughs> worldview explain and deal with evil? And, and what I think what John is pushing on here is this, is that, I mean, where does the standard of goodness even come from for you to talk about evil? And then to, to push it even further, like, I mean, what hope do you have to give someone? I mean, they, people die. That's it. Right? People suffer and die. That's the way that most of the world lives. What do you got to say to that? Because the first time he didn't say anything. I know, I got you both. Suffering. <laughs> if I have a really bad case of food poisoning, and any of you have had this, you know how, how much it sucks. Right? You're, you're vomiting all day. You, you, you can't even watch sitcoms. You're suffering so much. And then, and then you get well and you go back to school or work or whatever. That is not, that suffering, why is that bad? Where's the value judgment coming in that it's bad? It's bad because it hurts. It doesn't feel good. It's not bad because it's evil. It's bad because it hurts, and I'd rather not have food poisoning. So I think badness, suff human suffering is bad. The, the, the people at the Boston Marathon who were killed and maimed by the Boston Marathon bomber I think that was very, very bad. Why? Because I'm a human being, they're human beings, suffering is, is not desirable. So I judge that as bad. I then judge that the fellow who, who um, bombed those folks did the wrong thing. Why? Because he created badness. I don't think the judgment of evil is even involved there. I don't feel it is. I don't think I run into John's inconsistency as an atheist here. My perception, judgment about badness comes from the pain of suffering. And since I have empathy, and I can feel other people's suffering, 
From that, I derive moral judgments that certain actions are wrong. This satisfies me. It's a non-theistic account of rightness and wrongness. You ready? Oh, I'm ready. Okay. I've, just, I've just learned a very important lesson. I've been waiting. It's very unwise for a mathematician to tangle with a philosopher. <laughs> that, the, the whole problem, of course, you, you raise questions that I agree with. They're absolutely valid. And the truncated nature of my uh, statement is what causes them. If I were to phrase myself more carefully, the existence of love, in our world depends on the possibility, not the actuality of evil. If you can conceive the Genesis situation originally, according to the biblical text, the Garden of Eden, and so on, the human pair could love one another, but there was the possibility. If you're going to be able to love, there must be that possibility, and they made the wrong choice. That's point number one. We could have a huge philosophy seminar on this. The next point was you took us to the other end of history and to heaven. And it's such an interesting question. The claim is that there will be a perfect world without sinning. Does that mean that free will is gone? Well, the way I approach it, and Q&As, of course, are unsatisfactory because we could spend hours on this, but simple-mindedly, the way I approach it is I don't think God puts us back to where we start exactly. Let me be personal. When I became a Christian, I decided that I would submit my life to the lordship and authority of Jesus Christ. That was an irreversible act through which I received what we call eternal life. Now, that may sound j jargon to you, but you need to listen to what Christianity claims before you judge it. And I do believe that in that act, I use that freedom of will to make a decision that in the end will result in the kind of paradise that's described in the book of Revelation. There's something irreversible that's happened. So when all the uh, sinfulness of personality is sloughed off, we will enter into an absolutely new realm. But I take the point, moderator, well. He's quite correct in making that objection because I didn't give a sensitive enough approach earlier. And he's probably not satisfied yet, but who, have you ever met a philosopher who was? <laughs> there are a lot of good questions that have been uh, submitted, so, but let's keep somewhat along these lines here. I'm gonna ask uh, a number of different questions and then you guys can answer them accordingly. One question is, uh, where do moral uh, values come from, objective morality come from? The other is, what gives humanity significance or meaning? Okay. And then the last is, uh, what happens when we die? And I think all those questions can be wrapped around this question of morality, evil, and that sort of thing. So, do you like to go first, Don? These are huge questions. <laughs> uh, and is this from the audience? Yep. Yeah. All Thank you, audience, audience, for making our lives so difficult. Um, <laughs> but that's good. Right, John? We, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think that... Uh, They're bobcats, after all. Where, <laughs> where does morality come from? Is that what... Yep. Yeah. Uh, Objective morality, to be precise. Objective morality. I, I'm a, I take a little bit of issue with the the way the question's phrased, I, I, I think where objective reality comes from is a little question begging. Um, does morality have to be objective for morality to exist? And I, and, and I fear here now a false dichotomy um, between um, moral absolutism and moral nihilism. Sometimes I hear the argument that if there isn't an absolute moral truth, then there's moral nihilism, meaning there's no morality whatsoever. And those are the only two options. Well, my God, if those are the only two options, we better pick absolute morality over moral nihilism because moral nihilism, as John said, means everything is permitted, as Dostoevsky said, and that's anarchy and chaos. We don't want that. So then we choose uh, 
God's metaphysical moral law, because that's moral, morally objective truth. Um, I think it's a false dichotomy. I think humans, and, and, and we see this daily, can forge um, moral law by intersubjective agreement, by consent. We, after all, we do this legally. They're called legal laws, legislation. We manage as a, a, a human society to, to come up with legal laws that govern our behavior. I have hope in humanity and faith that we can, and, and, and we do, um, come to agreement about, in a kind of social contract kind of way, about um, moral laws, how we should treat each other as human beings. I think this is real. It's not, it does not capture objective moral truth, but I think objective moral truth is illusory. I don't think it exists, but I'm not a moral nihilist either. That's um, my short answer to the question. Are you going to answer the other two, or will, to, will we take one at a time? Why don't you take one at a time? Yes. About that. Very briefly, my own view is that just as rationality is part of the image of God in humans and is a magnificent gift, so we are moral beings. And I do believe there are absolute morals. Well, first of all, I believe there's an objective morality, and I think that's essentially testable in the sense that uh, C.S. Lewis in 1940 wrote a book called The Abolition of Man, and there's an appendix at the back of it that points out if you go all around the world, every philosophy, every religion, people who believe in God, people who don't, you will find a common core of moral values. The natural law theorists call a deep conscious, sundaresis, which refers to those things that humanity essentially has in common. In fact, if we didn't have them, society would fall apart. So I think the fact of a common pool of morality indicates there is an objectivity. Point number two, I think we all believe that certain things are absolutely right. For instance, I would suspect that no one in this room thinks it would be under any circumstances right to torture an infant. And J.L. Mackey, who is an atheist, by the way, a very well-known philosopher at Oxford, he said it's a relatively short path from accepting that they're absolute morals to believing in God. So I think there is an argument to be made there that the existence of objective morality and certain things that we recognize as absolute sit much more consistently with an origin in lawgiver than in an origin in random unguided natural processes that can't even produce rationality. So that's where I sit on this question. Don't you think there is a point here? I mean, isn't there something more than a kind of social contract that determines that torturing babies is wrong? I mean, isn't it just wrong? I mean, to say that, oh, well, we've all decided that this is wrong seems a bit weak. I think that um, the, uh, the almost, as John says, the almost universal consensus um, could be explained uh, naturalistically. And I'm, there might be one forthcoming explanation there. And I think the universal consensus need not be explained metaphysically. I think it could be explained naturalistically. Um, and out of that emerges the truth, what, I, which, what I'd call an intersubjective truth, not an objective truth, that um, killing, torturing uh, a human infant is, is wrong. Um, I don't think we need a metaphysical fact to back up the, um, the intersubjective agreement. May I just make a little point in case there's a confusion here? when you talk about social contract theory or utilitarianism and so on, in ethics, there are various ethical systems. They're not actually mutually exclusive. It's very important to realize that. That society, of course, makes laws by social contract. And uh, we all work in a utilitarian way in certain instances. The maximum benefit for the maximum number of people. If you're dividing ice cream among 100 kids, you'd better do it as a utilitarian or you're in trouble. Everyone gets an equal amount. But there are problems with these views when you attempt to explain them naturalistically. 
You see, if I'm Hitler and I think the maximum benefit for the maximum number of people is to murder 8 million Jews, what are you going to say? Utilitarianism and the social contract works very well when you have equal centers of power. But once I get enough power that I don't care what you do to me, and you say, can we make a social contract? And I say, why should I bother? I've got the guns, old chap. Oh, but you should. Why? It's where that should comes from that you need to have an answer to. And if you don't have any transcendent morality, it seems to me that it ends up being subjective. Now, that's a huge topic, so I'm going to stop. Well, I think there's a difference between subjective and intersubjective. That's why I use the word intersubjective. I think, John, that um, if somebody somehow is on, is, is on the outside and, and out there, in fact, torturing babies, and um, the, the rest of us try to stop him or her because we think it's wrong, I think it's efficient there to say that the rest of us are empathetic enough to know that both the baby and the parents will suffer enough that that simply shouldn't be done. Um, and to me, that will motivate people to try to stop that behavior as much as they can and judge it as wrong. I don't think we need a metaphysical explanation. There were two other questions yes. hidden there. Uh, I've forgotten them, I'm afraid. Sure, sure. So you can tie them together here. What gives humanity significance and what happens to us after or when we die? Well, I was interested in what Don said in his introduction because I agree with a lot of it. You know, he said he'd go home after this lecture, he'd be with his wife, with his children, he'd do a marathon running up and down the peaks here and so on. And he gains fulfillment in that. Of course he does. God has put us in a magnificent universe with all these wonderful capacities that we can enjoy and have fulfillment. But fulfillment comes at different levels. And of course, the, the ultimate question is, if that's all going to be extinguished at death, is there any such thing as ultimate fulfillment? Well, you might say, I don't need that. Maybe you don't, but I'm not interested in what you need or what you don't need. I'm interested in what is true about this universe. If I'm lying on the beach with the sun shining down and you're up on a cliff and you see the oceans coming in all around me, I feel great. I don't need anything. And you can see that I need rescuing. What would you rather? Just be left with feeling I don't need anything. Or would you be rather told the truth? And since I was a child, precisely because I was brought up in a Christian background, I decided in my first week at Cambridge, I wanted to be sure if this was true. So how did I go about it? By befriending people that didn't share my worldview. And I've been doing it for over 50 years since. I don't want to be fooled, ladies and gentlemen. And I notice tonight it's come up very often, I don't need that as an explanation, or I don't need this. Well, okay, you may not need it, but the question is, what is the nature of the case? What is true? That's the thing that motivates me, and that's what I want to find out. So, uh, to respond to the question, there are different levels of meaning. The biggest meaning for me, I love my wife. I think it's absolutely thrilling to have a family, to have a good marriage, and so on, that I've enjoyed for 46 years. It's, that is wonderful sense of fulfillment. But there's a bigger thing than that. It's the friendship of God day by day. For 50 years, I've lived with a sense of God's presence and his love and his guidance and so on. To have a friendship with the creator of the universe is a colossal thing. And it is what is offered to us through Christ. How big is your universe? And I'm afraid one of the reasons I reject atheism is the tininess of the universe it leaves us in. Death wipes everything out. And so there's no ultimate significance. So we have to rest content with those lovely fulfillments we've had. But shadows begin to fall even on those when dark days come in life. You mentioned the human eye. Why does it fade? It fades, sir, because this planet was never meant to be anything more than temporary. And it's not simply eyes fading. It's death, of course. We all have to face it. And it's better to face the issues of what is the truth about death when you're healthy than when you've been given just a few months to live.
My first reaction is the question, uh, Greg, was it what makes humans special? What gives humanity significance? Uh, it, 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 it assumes that no humanity has that. significance in the first place, so that might be questionable. Um, to me, it's funny because my sensibilities are just, just the opposite. Um, for me, mortality does make my life significant, um, and it makes those small fulfillments even more magical because they are temporary. And now I'm sort of borrowing kind of a Camus um, position here, Albert Camus, but to me, striving for meaning in an otherwise meaningless universe makes my life meaningful. And what is the significance of my life? It's that striving, and I feel that the, what I regard as a fact, that uh, non-existence awaits me in maybe 30, 40 years, maybe tomorrow, I don't know, um, increases the significance of my few hours I have here. So I think we have a difference in sensibility about the meaning of life, but that's how I feel about it. And I think that's why I said it in the opening remarks that I feel that perhaps a godless universe is more meaningful than a universe with design. And I, of course, inevitably distinguish between what I feel about it and what's true about it. I think that significance, in the biggest sense, is the image of God. The heavens declare the glory of God, but they're not made in his image. You are. And if ever there was a teaching that gives us such value and dignity, it's that, isn't it? I remember giving the first lecture in Siberia after the fall of communism. And there was a whole army of KGB people present and all the rest of it, huge crowd. And I was asked, what's the difference between what the Bible says about humans and, and communism? And I said, you know, there's one statement at the beginning of the Bible that humans were made in the image of God. I said, have I really believed that? I wouldn't murder one of you, let alone the hundred million that Stalin did. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, when he came to America, made a famous speech, didn't he? And he said, if I am asked why we lost a hundred million of our best people, he said, I think the answer is inevitably we have forgotten God. And I can never forget in the Academy of Sciences, I've been to Russia many times, because I'm interested in what atheism does to societies. And a member of the Academy of Science said to me, John, he said, you know, we thought that we could get rid of God and retain a value for human beings, and we realized far too late it was impossible. And I say to the West, ladies and gentlemen, you might think you can get rid of God and retain a value for human beings. The experiment hasn't been running very long. Our time is beginning to come to an end here, so I want to end with one last question for the both of you. It, it, it's, it's simply, I'll give a little introduction to, uh, to both of you, because I, I want to talk. I don't get to talk very much, and so I really... Oh, please, that would be a great relief. I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it is. Um, wh what would it take for you, for either of you, to realize or to believe that you are wrong about your worldview? John, the other day I was reading, uh, you mentioned Alvin Plantiga before, and I was reading Warranted Christian Belief. Uh, let me say I was reading, but not necessarily comprehending, but I was reading, okay? No problem. But in the midst of this huge tome, he says something like this. He says, you know what? I realized that, that I could be wrong about this. I could be dreadfully, drastically wrong. If there are other people out there, same level of intelligence, same... Uh, uh, virtues, and that's a human condition, right? That I could be wrong, mm -hmm. right? Don, I was reading another book, which I did not understand either. Uh, it's what I like to do with my spare time, read books I don't understand. And uh, it's Charles Taylor, and I, it, you, both of you know who Charles Taylor is, and he talks about, he says this, he says, 
that when it comes to atheism, he doesn't use that word, but we'll use that word. When it comes to atheism, right? He says that atheism, if you, if you, is often haunted by, haunted by the specter of transcendence. And that, they, and that oftentimes there's a feeling of, of loss, right? That their, their actions, the things that they do, a lack of kind of substance, a, a lack of deep resonance. What would it take for you to realize, right, there is a transcendence, there, there is a God, and that without that there isn't any meaning? Short, what does it take for you guys to think that you're wrong, that you could possibly be wrong? Uh, yeah. First, Greg, um, and I do feel that what I do has great resonance uh, virtually every action I undertake. So I, I'm not sure I need more resonance than I currently have. Um, what would it take? It would take revelation. If we're talking theism versus atheism, for me it would take direct revelation. That would, I mean, if, you know, if I leave tonight and suddenly... I, I see God come down on the street to me and say, Lennox was right, you were wrong. Um, yeah, I'm going to change my belief. So it does, it's going to take revelation. Uh, can I say one more thing? Quickly, quickly. No, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. I got the okay. Okay, what worries me about um, justifying secular misery by eternal life saying that it's worth it for eternal bliss and for mm -hmm. eternal harmony, is that that means we may not condemn it absolutely. If there's an ultimate escape route in eternal life for anyone, that worries me. I'd rather that the doors be closed and that a secular life be reality so we're accountable in this life. What would it take me to change my mind? Well, it would take a number of things. You'd have to prove to me and give me evidence that Jesus did not rise from the dead. You'd have to prove to me that all the detailed predictions made throughout the history of the prophetic tradition within Judaism, which find their accurate fulfillment in the New Testament were simply a series of coincidences. You would have to prove to me that the rise of Christianity can be explained on the basis of a non-resurrection. You'd also have to deny for me the testability of Christianity. You see, Jesus made the claim that if I trust him and repent, I receive forgiveness and the guilt of my sin will go and I receive a new life and peace with God. I've tested that. And I've seen it transform life after life after life. You would have to prove to me that all that is an illusion. That these people who get rescued, maybe from near suicide, from uh, addictions, from dependencies of all sorts of kinds, and bring joy into their family, marriages rescued from divorce, and so on. And they all attribute it to faith in Christ. You'd have to show me that that is all coincidence and there's nothing behind it. So, of course, it's falsifiable because... Christianity itself is testable. But I actually answered the question previously, but perhaps you didn't notice it. I have spent my entire life being critical of my faith in Christ because I want to be sure. So I've asked myself this question again and again and again. And what has happened as a result of that is that my faith has grown. So it would take an enormous lot, but it's not theoretically impossible because I am subject to la condition humaine as well as anybody else. Men, thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic. Let's give them another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.